judges. Would you please introduce yourselves? Good afternoon. My name is Becca Steinhoff. I am joining today from Casper, Wyoming. I am the executive director of the John P. L. Bogan Foundation, and I'm looking forward to hearing from you. Hello, everyone. My name is Scott Barnhart. I am currently in Indianapolis, Indiana. I am an attorney. I work at the Indiana Attorney General's Office. I serve as the chief counsel and director of the Consumer Protection Division. I'm a We the People alum, and I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say. I'm Marsha Holland. I'm in Missoula, Montana. I'm an attorney, but most of my legal career was not here, but up in Fairbanks, Alaska, which meant I took a lot of trips to Hawaii. And have, upon moving back to Montana, I teach at the law school here. And I've been helping with this program for uh, quite a while, and I'm always so excited to hear from you. So looking forward to the conversation. All right, and students, please introduce yourselves as well as any coach um, or mentor or teacher that you would like to recognize. Hello, my name is Frances Balsita. I'm a junior at McKinley High School, and we are accompanied by our teacher and one mentor, Sean Kamita, today. Hi, my name is Byron Kim, and I'm a senior at McKinley High School. Hello, and I'm Erwin. I'm a junior at McKinley High School. Wonderful. Well, thank you. This is Unit 6, and we will hear from you today. Question number two. President Dwight D. Eisenhower said, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence by the military industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. Do you agree or disagree? Why? What disagreements did the founders have about a standing army and are they relevant today? To what extent should there be an international US military presence? You may begin when you're ready. Once a supreme commander of all allied forces, ex-US President Eisenhower believed that while our military is necessary to secure our nation, it is imperative citizens to keep a close eye on the power armed forces hold so we are not dictated by them. He prompts our civilians to ask ourselves, are we creating something that will eventually destroy our democracy? As a collective, we agree with Eisenhower's worries regarding the military industrial complex. To, the, to answer the question why, we will first explore the military component of the military industrial complex. After, we will expand on how the industrial portion ties into it. After the revolution, Americans believed a standing army was a dangerous threat to liberty. Brutus, a pen name for an anti-federalist often acknowledged as Robert Yates, wrote within an essay published in a New York journal that standing armies are dangerous to the liberties of a people, not only because the rulers may employ them for the purposes of supporting themselves in any usurpation of powers, but there is a great hazard that any army will subvert the forms of government under whose authority they are raised and establish one according to the pleasures of their leader. Of the Founding Fathers, the Anti-Federalists worried that someone would use their army for personal gain, or the army itself would overthrow the government. Federalists, however, argued that a standing army was necessary for security. James Wilson, in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 12 of the United States Constitution declared, the power of raising and keeping up an army in time of peace is essential. No government can secure its citizens against dangers internal and external without possessing it. To combat the potential of misplaced power, the Army Clause gave power to the Congress, which the founders viewed as the closest branch of government to the people, and reinforced the Congress's authority over a standing army. Eisenhower, like the Founding Fathers, worried that, without close supervision, the armed forces may overthrow our government. In his speech, he stresses that civilians be alert and watch military powers carefully. After World War I, the United States disarmed our abroad armies and became isolationists, wanting no part in another war. However, after World War II, the US kept a large standing army. Since then, our global military presence has expanded to become the largest in the world. In 2019, the Department of Defense publicly released that our nation has military personnel in more than 100 and 60 countries. And the Pentagon in its official property portfolio listed 4,775 sites. As a result of military expansion, the power of the private companies that supply the military rises as well. 
It is important to note that the military combats the potential for a single private company to attempt to control the government by making use of multiple suppliers, such as Boeing, Lockheed Martin, and Raytheon Technologies and General Dynamics. However, numbers from the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute hold that 47 American companies fill the top 100 grossing slots in the world. According to Defense News, in 2018, the industrial component of the military industrial complex brought in $192.3 billion in weapon sales. Given this information, the worries, of, the worries the founder and Eisenhower had concerning the military industrial complex and a, and a standing army are valid and relevant today. As a collective, we believe that the US should withdraw some of its global presence. We agree that pol policing the world exhausts not only our funding, but our personnel. To combat this, we suggest the military make use of our allies. Our NATO allies, for example, should be pushed to assist countries our military inhabit. As stated, we do not believe that our nation should completely disarm our standing armies. We should keep the bases in countries necessary for security reasons. Bases in Japan, for instance, are very essential to our security as they are gatekeepers and guards against China, North Korea, and Russia. This concludes our presentation. So I have a question to kind of follow up on your on your opening statements. If you believe that we should withdraw our presence worldwide, um, either contraction physically in the form of uh, reducing troops or financially in the form of from a budgetary standpoint, what impact will that have on our reputation worldwide and in, in the United States as a superpower? I would affect it in some type of negative way because we did develop these um, alliances with other foreign areas because we've been with them giving supplies, giving them troops and all of that. Even though it would cause a disruption in our reputation in a sense, it is still important to note that we must take care of our own nation before others. I agree with Erwin and to expand on that, I feel that once you put your foot down in a country Country, it can be hard to take it out. Um, some places like Afghanistan, we're kind of there for moral obligation. There are places um, like Byron said in our script, like Japan, where it's for security reasons. And I do feel that as of right now, you're absolutely correct. The United States is a superpower. But are we able to continue to exhaust our resources using such a grand and large army? Or would our efforts be better used if we place them and push them towards working on domestic issues or just lessening how much money and budgeting we allot to the army and repurposing it for things that are actually within our nation, like homelessness and education, stuff like that. So let me ask you this. You mentioned in your opening um, statement that in World War I, the United States responded by becoming an isolationist nation. And then after World War II, um, an expansion happened. And those are the last two actually declared wars, but there've been five other conflicts. What made the change happen? Why did the United States move from World War I to World War II to even though we haven't been in a war since World War II, an ever increasing um, military and industrial complex? Any thoughts? Well, once we, once we came back to help our allies and as we were called into World War II, um, after World War II, we left our standing armies where they are. And the way a really popular strategy that the army has been expressing and using is basically foot in the door. So we have, all the places we are inhabiting now. And once another country looks the other way or we get ourselves there, we just we go. And then we set our foot there and we establish ourselves there. That's why the army has such a large presence in so many um, troops in so many countries is because we make use of this strategy and wherever and whenever we are able to expand, the army does it. Thank you. And and adding on to what Francis said um, on how military has a good has a presence on different countries. 
Afghan Afghanistan, for example, relies on our military as well. And if we do retract our troops from Afghanistan, they would revert back to their original ways on how they're more limited in their social standards. Thanks. You gave some focus to, um, in your opening statement, Congress getting authority for the military because they were closest to the people. Um, and then it said that civilians should be alert and, and watch what's happening there. Do you think that civilians are, are making the most of the control that was given to them by the founders? Um, and if so, or what can be done to um, help increase that control? I think that how our society works, it's a very domino effect. So when the people such as you and I want to see change in our government, we start advocating for things, we bring it up to Congress, Congress brings it even further and it just goes down this chain until everybody hears our ideas. So I feel that if the people wanted more control, then we should start there. We should start with us, make the change, advocate for ourselves more, spread information about what we want to see, be very open and talk, be very expressive for what we want to see reflected in our government. Adding on to what Francis said, yeah, it really is based on what one person does and is able to affect the others and how they interpret it in a way. If we want to increase and make people more knowledgeable about the power we have in controlling the government or controlling the military in a sense, we need to make sure that everyone is aware by presenting this type of information and knowledge. So that way they can use it for reasons to help our nation as a whole. So <clears throat> has the military become military in, in the sort of accompanying companies and in the bases and all that as an economic engine? Is it too big to fail? Meaning that if we retract and we, we limit the amount of spending, aren't we going to significantly impact our economy, both nationally and internationally? There shouldn't be as major retractions from the amount of spending we do for the military, there should be a specific type of amount that we are doing. Nothing that would be drastically, sorry, major in a sense that would affect us badly, but just enough so that way we can focus our spendings and other things that would be more relevant or more important as of today. I think what Erwin is saying is that, of course, with the retraction of troops and lessening the power that the military, uh, the presence that the military holds will affect our economy because that's what we're doing. We're, we're hindering how much the uh, industries that supply the military are able to produce and the effects that they have. Um, what Erwin, I would like to expand on is if it's out of necessity, uh, economically speaking, then sure, we can keep our relations with a certain place. But as a whole, of course, lessening the amount of presence you have will have an effect on the economy. But I'd like to make it noted, noted that we have have many different areas that we weaponry in. It's not just, you know, gun making and produce. I'm sure I'll start asking a question and there won't be time for the answer, but do you think we should shift um, the focus to diplomatic relations rather than military presence and just re repurpose the military bases abroad so that it's more focused on diplomacy and building relationships than on just a strong military presence? Yes, I do. I think that would be a much more sustainable I idea to, <laughs> yes. Good job. I'm going to start with comments here. So I was just taking a look at my notes. I think the we really appreciated the way you started out your prepared remarks um, in terms of kind of laying out what we could expect to hear from you. Uh, that was helpful and it kind of gives us in addition to the, the prompts that you've been given um, a sense of where we're headed and a way um, to think about the roadmap that is ahead of us. Um, I 
really liked how you pulled in some of the history and, and really talked us through um, the who was for, who was against, and what some of those arguments might have been for the standing army. Um, I think a lot of really good context came there and then you um, shifted and I think had some really strong information about the, the current context and what exists in terms of um, global participation or presence and then um, just the, the look at what's happening with contractors. Um, so I think you included a lot of research and it's always great um, to hear some of that. I really um, like some of what you talk about in terms of the um, other opportunities or opportunity cost that we might have with um, funding the military to the degree that it is, and perhaps there should be a focus on um, some of the issues that you talked about domestically, homelessness and education. I think that's really insightful um, and appreciated that. Um, I think you were thoughtful in um, addressing our questions and, and took some time to really think about how to respond and then use your teammates um, to get at some of that. Um, so overall, well done. Yeah, I, I agree. I thought, you, I thought you all did a great job. Um, very passionate about your positions, and, and that passion comes out. Absolutely. Um, I would be, be careful a little bit about going over on time. We're like trusty trail horses when we see the time card and we get a little bit blinded by that. So just be mindful of that kind of moving forward. Um, I also, I really appreciated how you um, used your precision of stats and, and statistics in your, your examples. And that precision, that precision <clears throat> and for example, I think you mentioned the Pentagon portfolio of 4,000 some um, locations. And uh, that helps sort of give credibility to your arguments and, and kind of support it in, in, a, in a kind of a different way. So I, I really appreciated that. I also appreciated your alliteration of, you know, the idea of physically seeing somebody step foot in the country and being able to pull them back. That was helpful as well. Uh, it's clear that you've studied this, this material and, and you've done very well. So good job. Nicely done. And ironically, I have down great use of stats, statistics, um, good research, really good examples. I really like the contrast World War I to World War II and really how the United States was perceived on the world stage. And just as Scott mentioned, the idea of a theme to your position as if one, you know, maybe we should quit putting our feet in so many countries. I really thought that's a really powerful visual image to use that brought your entire presentation together and everything else has already been said. So you, you kind of impressed us all in exactly the same way. So good job guys. I just want to say thank you so much for allotting this time of your day and very busy schedules. I'm sure you're all tired. Um, just thank you so much. We really appreciate um, the feedback, the criticism, and just your presence in general. It means a lot to us. And we appreciate your optimism. It's just you know, really give us hope. Yeah. Uh, thank you again for the feedback and all of the criticism as well. And then also putting up with everything that's going on with the whole pandemic and stuff. I know it may be difficult trying to get through this. So thank you so much for putting up with everything that's been happening. Well worth it. You're welcome. Worth it. Yeah. And thank you very much for the uh, criticism and feedback. Good luck. Thank you very much, judges.